Hi, everybody. This week, we're going to be discussing logic and deductive arguments and their role in, in writing a paper. As we kind of discussed last, we, last time, uh, arguments are, are, and critical thinking are going to be a really big part of writing a paper. The ability to critically think and be analytic means being able to evaluate whether something makes sense uh, argumentatively being able to judge and evaluate arguments. Because when we're writing a persuasive paper, essentially what we're doing is creating an argument. We're creating uh, a point of view that is defended by reason. And so it's important that we know the rules of logic and how arguments work. Because it's not necessarily clear that we know how to follow these rules typically it's often the case that because we're not taught logic uh, in schools, most people don't know what it is or how it works and aren't familiar with really being able to analyze and evaluate arguments because it, there's a very specific uh, aspect to it. It, it. It's a science. And so we need to know the right way of being able to form a position and then defend that position with reasons so that when we're writing an essay, we can make a point, support our, our point, and know that that argument that we've created can be a persuasive element for the reader. So there are a couple things that we're going to look at this module first propositions propositions are the things that make up arguments so it's important that we talk about them then we're going to discuss arguments and then types of logic we're going to be looking at deductive logic uh, this module and next module we'll look at inductive logic also really briefly just kind of describe abductive logic even though it's not something that we're typically going to use here as it doesn't give us a very precise understanding of things so isn't going to be necessarily as important when it comes to uh, forming positions. Then we're going to look uh, most importantly on how we evaluate arguments. So what makes an argument good and what makes an argument bad? This is essentially the logic component. Logic is the study of determining whether or not an argument is good or bad. And we judge arguments based on their structure. We judge them based on their content and uh, their comprehension and how well they make sense. After that, uh, I'll put up a couple exercises so that we can practice this new skill and hopefully we'll be able to begin to form arguments for our papers. And so, like I said, arguments are made up of propositions, uh, essentially statements, and statements are different than assertions necessarily, or uh, statements are, are, are not the only linguistic act that we use. Some linguistic acts that we use are interrogative or imperative or exclamations. These things don't say anything about the world and so aren't going to be helpful for us. When we form a position, when we form an argument, we need to do so with propositions. And a proposition is any statement that can be true or false. Now, it's not necessarily the case that it's definitely true or that it's definitely false. Just because something is false doesn't not make it a proposition. It's just a false proposition. And if it's true, then it's a true proposition. However, what we need when forming an argument is a proposition. So that when we start to write a paper, we're going to begin by coming up with a thesis statement. Now that thesis statement is going to be a proposition. It's going to be a statement that is either true or it's false. Ideally, it's going to be a true statement because that's the thing that we want to prove to the reader. And so when we form arguments, when we write a paper, we assert a thesis and then we support that thesis with reasons, all of which are going to be propositions. So if you look at the list here, we can see that we have some propositions and some non-propositions. The first sentence, for instance, is a proposition. Chocolate makes you fat. Now, whether that's true or that's false doesn't matter. Only that it could be true or could be false. 
because I can evaluate that sentence, because I can attribute a value of true or false, that sentence is a proposition and can therefore be something that I must try to prove. Same thing with I am giving a lecture. Now, in my instance, I'm giving a lecture, so that proposition is true. For you, however, you might think that proposition is false. Either way, it's a proposition because it has with it a value, a value of truth or a value of false. Now take those two and compare it to number three. Give me 20 push-ups. Here we can't say that this sentence is true or false. It's just a, it's a, it's an assertion, it's a statement, it's a linguistic act that doesn't have a truth value. It doesn't, it, it's not a statement that can be true or false. And if it can't be true or false, then it can't be evaluated. And if it can't be evaluated, then it's not going to serve us in terms of trying to prove a point. Same thing with number four. Four says, does chocolate make you fat? And it's a question. Questions can't be propositions because they're not something that is true or false. They don't have a truth value associated with them. Questions simply inquire about the world. They don't tell you about the world. If I were to, however, answer this question by saying, yes, chocolate makes you fat, then that statement is a proposition. This is why when we write a paper, it's often important for us to think of a question that needs answering. I'm asking you questions in your assignment prompts so that when you answer them, you will be answering in the form of a proposition. And that proposition, in order for you to prove that is true, must defend it in the right way. Now take number five, chickens fly in the southern hemisphere. This again is a proposition. Even though it's not true, it still has a true or false value that can be associated with it. You can try to prove that number five is true, but you won't be able to. You can't even try to prove that three and four are true because they're not statements that have a truth value. If I ask, can you believe that? Again, it's a question and I'm not really telling you anything about the world. And so it's not a proposition. It doesn't have a true or false value. Same thing with number seven. I wonder if I should take the five or the 805. My wondering something, my simple thought of what I ought to do is not a proposition. It's only when I state that I am going to take the 805, that it becomes a proposition. Am I going to take the 805? Is that true? Or am I not gonna take the 805? And that's false. Number eight is a proposition. Triangles have three sides. That could be true, that could be false. In this case, it's obviously always true. My simple yelling out of John can't be a proposition because there's no truth value to that. You couldn't answer that. You couldn't respond to John with a simple true or false. Lastly, Texas is the largest uh, state in the United States of America. Again, it is a proposition, but it's a false proposition. You can try to prove that statement, but you won't have good reasons uh, for thinking that it's true, but you can try. Number six, number seven, and number nine, you can't even try to make those true because they're not statements that assert anything. And when you have multiple propositions where one proposition supports another proposition, we call that an argument. Typically, arguments have to have at least two propositions, one conclusion, and one supporting proposition that we call a premise. Most often you'll have one conclusion and two or more premises. Now you can have an argument with more 
Now you can have an argument with one premise, but typically these aren't going to be good arguments. Uh, we're often going to need more than one premise. You can also have three premises. You can have four premises, five premises. As long as you have one premise and one conclusion, then you can have an argument. And so when we think of premises, we think of the piece of information that's taken for granted. The reason, the most obvious piece of information that is used in support of the conclusion. The premises are going to essentially be your topic sentences for your paragraphs that you're going to find or do research for. Find expert opinion, quotes, statistics, information like that to guarantee the truth of your premises. Once you can guarantee the truth of your premises, once they are taken for granted, then hopefully, if structured properly, they will force your conclusion to be true. You can argue for a premise if you like, uh, and, and we're often going to have to do that when we write essays. But the more you argue for a premise, the more reasons you'll have to give for that premise to be true. For instance, if we look at this argument, Trump's travel ban can't be enforced. My reason for believing that is that Trump's travel ban is unconstitutional. And if Trump's travel ban is unconstitutional, it can't be enforced. But maybe when doing my research, I come to uh, conflicting evidence about whether Trump's travel ban is unconstitutional. Maybe some resources say that it is constitutional. Well, now I need to make an argument for whether or not premise one is true. And so I need to add more premises on top of that in order to prove that it is true so that I can use it along with the second premise two to prove conclusion two. This is essentially how we elongate a paper. We make a broad statement and then provide an argument for that broad statement. We then provide arguments for each premise and so on and so forth down the line until we can create a paper with clear, simple premises that get to a specific conclusion. It's also good to note that writing arguments like this in bullet point is what we refer to as standard form. Standard form arguments are arguments in which the bottom most line is the ultimate conclusion that you want to prove and all the lines above it are premises or reasons for why we should believe the conclusion. So when we're writing a paper, think of your conclusion as being your thesis statement and everything above it being reasons and therefore will come to be topic sentences that you need to prove are true in order to get to your conclusion. Now, of the three types of logic, uh, we're going to focus now on deductive logic. Next time, we'll do inductive logic, and I'll give a brief description of abductive, uh, abductive logic uh, so that we can be clear um, how it is distinguished from the other two. Here we have a deductive argument written in standard form. Notice how the bottom proposition is in red, it is the conclusion. It is the thesis statement. The other two are reasons, they are premises, they are also propositions, but they work to prove the conclusion, prove the thesis statement. Now, deductive logic derives truth from its premises. And what that means is that based on the two premises, we can guarantee the absolute certainty of the conclusion. So if all humans are mortal and your teacher is a human, it must follow that your teacher is mortal. We can guarantee that based on the two premises in black. So here, if I were to write a paper, I would in my introduction express my thesis state statement 
clear and precisely, your teacher is mortal. I would then explain my reasoning for why I think your teacher is mortal in a way that explains that all humans are mortal and that your teacher is human. I would then transition to the next sentence, uh, to the next paragraph, and then in that next paragraph, I would use the entire paragraph to prove all humans are mortal. I would do research, find expert opinion, uh, definitions of words, whatever it takes, quotes, anecdotes, to prove that all humans are mortal. Once I've proven that all humans are mortal, I can move on to the next paragraph and prove that your teacher is a human. I can explain the biological makeup, I can explain the anatomy, all of this stuff needing to, needed to prove that your teacher is a human. Once I've proven that all humans are mortal and then I've proven that your teacher is a human, it must be the case that your teacher is mortal. Therefore, I have now created an argument and a paper proving that your teacher is mortal. Here we have an inductive argument. Inductive arguments derive probability from the premises rather than certainty. So while in the last example, the conclusion in red was guaranteed by the truth of the premises, here the conclusion is only probable from the premises. So if I want to argue that Socrates has a beard, I can appeal to the idea that most Greeks have beards and Socrates is a Greek. And so if Socrates is a Greek and most Greeks have beards, it is probably the case that Socrates has a beard. Now he might not, but probability is in my favor. Once again, Socrates has a beard is going to be my thesis statement. And I will express that clearly and precisely in the introduction. In the introduction, I will also show that I believe that proposition because I think that most Greeks have beards and I think Socrates is a Greek. My next paragraph, I will then work to prove that most Greeks have beards by providing statistics. And I will provide the, uh, or I will, in the next paragraph, I will show that Socrates is a Greek and provide exam historical examples in order to back that up. So that if I can prove that most Greeks have beards and I can prove that Socrates is a Greek, then it, it looks as though Socrates ought to have a beard or probably has a beard. Inductive arguments, inductive logic is often uh, less persuasive because there always is that probability that it's not the case, uh, but it's typically going to be an argument style that we use more often because certainty is is pretty rare. Lastly, abduction derives its explanation from just a likely observation. So here I can make the claim that the defendant is probably guilty. Why would I think that? Well, the defendant stutters and seems to get confused easily, and the defendant doesn't make eye contact with the accuser. That Those two premises by themselves don't guarantee the defendant is being probably guilty, but with all that we know about how people act in terms of being questioned and their guilt and their conscience, it paints a likely picture of what seems to be the case based on uh, personal experience and historical information. Same thing from the others. What's in red is my thesis statement. In my introduction, I'm going to explain that thesis statement and then support it with its reasons. That way, when anybody reads the introduction, they will know what I want to prove, namely that the defendant is probably guilty, and then they'll know how I intend to believe, how I intend to get you, or how I intend to persuade you to believe that. And I would persuade you that that is true based on the fact that I think the defendant stutters and seems to get confused easily, and that the defendant doesn't make eye contact with the accuser. When I then prove those two premises to be true or likely, I can then draw the conclusion that the defendant is probably guilty.
And so when we evaluate arguments, we do so in two ways. Arguments can typically go wrong in two ways. Either the structure of the argument is not set up right, in that the premises don't support the conclusion, or just some premises may be false, in which case you're using incorrect information and an argument shouldn't be believed. If I were to look at this argument, I would see that it doesn't make sense. It's a bad argument because the structure is bad. If I want to prove to you that James uh, must have walked out the door to this class, if I want to prove that James walked out the door to this class, and I try to defend that by saying, well, if he walks out the door, then he will be outside, and I see that he's outside, those two premises don't guarantee that he walked out the door to this class. He could have, in fact, started outside of the class, or he could have jumped out the window. Nothing from these two premises get me to believe the conclusion, and therefore, they're not structured in a way that guarantees or even leads to the probability of the conclusion being true. This argument, on the other hand, is wrong for a different reason. Here we have an argument wrong because a proposition is false. And so if I were to explain that Donald Trump is a highly popular president and that if a president is highly popular, he is likely to be a good leader, I would be guaranteed that Trump is likely to be a good leader. So here the structure is good, but the content is off. The second premise is false. And if the second premise is false, then we don't need to believe our conclusion. It's therefore important that we structure the argument properly, but also have true content. Structuring is what makes an argument valid. And valid is one of the most important concepts in, argue, uh, in argumentation. A valid argument is one in which the conclusion follows from the premises. That means that the conclusion is guaranteed if the premises are true. The premises infer the conclusion. We therefore have to ask ourselves, is there a way to deny the conclusion even if I were to pretend the premises were true? So when you're determining the validity of an argument, when you're determining whether or not there's good structure, you pretend the premises are true and then ask yourself, is there a way for me to deny the conclusion? If you can deny the conclusion, it's invalid. But if you can't deny the conclusion, if it's a logical necessity that you believe the conclusion based on the true premises, then the argument is structured well and then must be considered further for whether or not the premises are actually true. Take this argument, for instance. All soccer players are married to pop stars. David Beckham is married to a pop star. Therefore, David Beckham is a soccer player. Here we have an invalid argument because I can imagine the two propositions in black being true while the proposition in red is false. For instance, I can imagine a world where all soccer players are married to pop stars. I can also imagine a world where David Beckham is married to a pop star. But what if the David Beckham from premise two isn't David Beckham that we know, the soccer player, but is uh, David Beckham, the trash collector? If that David Beckham that I'm talking about in premise two is a trash collector, it doesn't necessarily follow that David Beckham is a soccer player because I've already assumed him to be in a different position. All soccer players are married to pop stars is not equivalent to all pop star, all people married to pop stars being soccer players. And therefore, I can accept the two premises as being true, but deny the conclusion. Compare that to this argument. Every man married to a former Spice Girl is a soccer player. David Beckham, the man, is married to a former Spice Girl. Therefore, David Beckham is a soccer player. 
Here we have a valid argument. The structure is good. And the reason it's good is because if I were to believe the two premises in black, I would be forced into believing the conclusion in red. So that if I believe that every man married to a former Spice Girls soccer player, every single one, and I believe that David Beckham, the man, is married to a former Spice Girl, then it must be the case that he falls within the group of every man and is therefore a soccer player. Here, it's logically impossible for me to imagine the first premises being true while denying the conclusion. This is a valid argument. This is what we're aiming for when we present arguments. That way, when we show our premises to be true in our paragraphs that we reference and find information about, then we're guaranteed to get our conclusion. What about this argument? All lions understand Spanish. Some penguins are lions, therefore some penguins understand Spanish. This also is a valid argument. The structure is precise. The structure is good. I cannot accept the premises and deny the conclusion here, because if I believe that all lions understand Spanish and some penguins are lions, then those lions must understand Spanish, or those penguins that are lions must understand Spanish. The structure here is good, and therefore the argument is valid. We cannot deny the conclusion if we accept the premises. So if you were to somehow be able to prove to me that all lions understand Spanish, and then prove to me that some penguins are lions, I would therefore have to believe that some penguins understand Spanish. And so an argument can be valid even if all its propositions are false, like in the last argument, or if one or all of its premises are false, but its conclusion is true. An argument can be invalid even if all of its propositions are true. Essentially, an argument can only not be valid, cannot be valid, if all of its premises are true and its conclusion is false. Because if all the premises are true, then it must follow that the conclusion is also true. I should not be able to accept the premises as being true and deny the conclusion. Otherwise, the argument is invalid and therefore doesn't provide reason for me to accept the conclusion. So when we think about validity, we're thinking about a relationship. We're thinking about the relationship between propositions, not necessarily their content, not what they're saying. We're thinking about how they relate to one another. If you look here at the bottom, you can see that it makes sense that this is structured well if we remove the, the predicates from the argument. All L understands S, some P or L, therefore some P understands S. When we get rid of the gibberish words, we can see that structurally, what's in red must come from what's in black. But of course, validity by itself doesn't make an argument good. We need something more than just a good structure, and that is good content. Structure along with content makes an argument sound. So the soundness of an argument is based on its validity and whether or not its premises are true. So if we have an argument that's valid and all of the premises are true, if it's valid, it would make the conclusion true as well. Therefore, the argument would, said, would be said to be sound. This is what our aim is for, sound arguments. Is this argument sound? Every man married to a former Spice Girl is a soccer player. David Beckham is married to a former Spice Girl. David Beckham is a soccer player. This argument is not sound. And the reason it's not sound is that the first proposition is false. Every man married to a former Spice Girl is a soccer player is just not true. So even though this argument is valid, right, if we were, if we were to believe 
the premises in black, we would have to believe the, premise, the conclusion in red, but we don't have to believe the premises in black because that first premise is false. How about this argument? Some soccer players are married to pop stars. David Beckham is married to a pop star. Therefore, David Beckham is a soccer player. This argument is also not sound. The reason why this argument's not sound is because it's not valid. So even though all of the propositions here are true, because the two premises in black do not guarantee my, premise, my conclusion in red, it's an invalid argument, and an invalid argument is automatically a bad argument. This argument, however, is a sound argument. All cats are mammals, Jessica is a cat, therefore Jessica is a mammal. If I accept what's written in black, I'm guaranteed what's written in red, and it just so happens that what is written in black is true. Assuming, obviously, that Jessica is, is a cat. So when we think of sound arguments, we're thinking of a subset of valid arguments. In other words, all sound arguments are valid, but not all valid arguments are sound. Lastly, in terms of evaluating arguments, is the cogency. And the cogency is just the comprehension of an argument. If I were to ask whether or not this argument was sound, it might be difficult for those that don't, or, or for those who aren't good at math and therefore couldn't judge the truth or falsity of the premises. So if I were to ask you that if there's an only a finite number of prime numbers, then the product of those primes plus one is not a prime. But then I tell you the product of those primes plus one is a prime. Is it the case that there's an infinite number of prime numbers? Just reading that feels like it's going over my head. And so if I can't determine whether the premises are true, then this isn't going to be a cogent argument and therefore isn't going to be an argument that I want to make. This is why when we make our arguments, we make them, uh, we, we express the premises in a way where we can defend them and show that they are true. Because when we show that they are true, we can then determine whether or not they guarantee our conclusion. And if they can guarantee our conclusion, then we have a good argument on our hands. If, for instance, I can believe your premises are true, or you even show me that the premises are true, but there's still a way for me to deny the conclusion, then the argument's invalid and therefore not good. So in conclusion, when we're Evaluating arguments, we want to do so on the basis of validity, soundness, and cogency. That way, when we write a paper, we're structuring it in the right way. We're structuring it in a way where we're creating valid arguments. We're then working by digging up references and re using resources to prove the truth of the premises in that argument, which should then guarantee the comprehension of the argument. So before we end, I want to go over three arguments. And I'm going to give you time now to determine for yourself whether or not these arguments are valid and sound. So you typically have three options. The argument is valid and sound, which means it's a good argument. It's valid but not sound, which means structurally it makes sense, but content-wise, something is false. Or it's invalid and therefore unsound, meaning that the structure isn't even right, so therefore it's automatically a bad argument. So why don't you pause the video and determine whether or not this argument is valid and sound. Pause the video now. If you determined that this argument was valid, but is not sound, then you are correct. The premises here guarantee the conclusion so that if you have a mullet, you are either very cool or very uncool. Michael has a mullet, therefore he's either one of the two options, but then I eliminate one of the options 
and therefore it must be the case that Michael is very uncool. So the structure here guarantees the conclusion by the premises. It's unsound, however, because some of these premises can't be uh, determined to be true. Take, for instance, the idea that Michael is not very cool. This is subjective and is different to everybody, and so therefore it can't necessarily be objectively true or false. So then arguing for that particular premise isn't really going to get you anywhere. Let's try the next one. All logicians are mad. Some mad people love Beethoven. Therefore, some logicians love Beethoven. Pause the video now. If you said the argument is invalid and therefore unsound, then you are correct. This argument is invalid. The premises do not guarantee the conclusion, which means I can accept a world in which the premises are true, but then deny the conclusion. So if you think about all logicians are mad and some mad people love Beethoven, it doesn't necessarily suggest that the logicians have to intersect with those that love Beethoven. Remember, it says all logicians are mad, which is different from all mad people are logicians. Therefore, these premises don't get us to the conclusion. Last one. Pause the video now. If you said that this argument is invalid and therefore unsound, then you are correct. Once again, if you were to believe the premises in black, you can still deny the conclusion. So if this glass of water is fresh and not contaminated, then it is drinkable. This glass of water is not fresh, therefore, it must be the case that this glass of water is not drinkable. Unfortunately, these premises don't guarantee the conclusion because I can imagine a world where I have a glass of fresh and not contaminated water and that it's drinkable. Now I can imagine that being true and I also can imagine that I also have a glass of water that's not fresh. I could still end up drinking the water that's not fresh though because the premises are just giving me one possible criteria of what it means for water to be drinkable. I haven't said about what it takes for water to be not drinkable. I can't just assume that something that doesn't make the water drinkable automatically makes it not drinkable. Therefore, these premises don't guarantee my conclusion. When writing papers, we need to write using good argumentation, meaning we need to structure our papers, structure our arguments in a way where our arguments are valid and that the premises are true. And using this structure of a standard form argument where you have bullets, with the bottom bullet being a conclusion, we are creating a very simplistic outline of an argument. Looking at this argument, we can see that the proposition in red, the conclusion, would be my thesis statement. The other two premises are going to be topic sentences for two different prepositions, two different paragraphs. Now, in some instances, it might take you more than one paragraph to prove one of these premises to be true, in which case you're probably proving some element within one of these is true. But in any case, even if I were to prove that these two premises were true, I would still be able to deny the conclusion. So even though I have a great paper with nothing but true statements, nothing but true propositions, it can still be a terrible argument and still therefore be not persuasive. So remember, just because you're using facts, just because you're using true statements, doesn't make a paper persuasive or good. You need more than just truth, you need proper structuring. And so it's important that we're structuring arguments in a way in which the conclusion in, is inferred by the premises and that the premises are true statements.